Well, all right. This week on the Big Show, we're one month before the kickoff of the summer movie season, and despite a few ripples of activity, all is quiet on the Western Front. We'll discuss how long Will Smith will be in movie jail, Whoopi Goldberg's new project, and the latest news on Huey P. Newton limited series. We'll have all that and more on episode 498, Keeping It Real with Film Gordon. Let's go. All right, and welcome to the latest episode of The Big Show, Keeping It Real with Film Gordon. I am Tim Gordon. I am joined by, I don't even know how to describe it, uh, my, my, my partner in crime, Charles Kirkland Jr., who all day long, I've been calling him up. He's got like some, you know, kind of like Morbius. He's got like two kind of aliases and a couple of things he's got going on. So how you doing, Charles? You good? Uh, I think you're referring to my manservant who, who's answering my phone don't, today. Don't so, do it, man. You, you so got us dragged on Twitter. I done told you we're in 2022. There's some stuff that used to work 20 years ago. You can't do that now. Don't even put us in that predicament trying to be funny. It's not funny. In 2022, don't do it. There are no manservants in 2022. Stop it. Stop it. Didn't you see the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air? Jeffrey is, is more like like the, the, the fixer instead of the butler in Bel Air. Think about, quote unquote, whatever that, that word you use. I'm not even referencing that. So Charles, how you doing, man? Leave it alone, man, stop it. You're getting ready to get us dragged. All I can say is, man, what's funny to you is not what's funny to somebody else. So uh, if you're here and you don't find me funny, then I'm, I'm sorry. Sometimes it's just the way it has to be. I didn't say I didn't find you funny. I'm saying that particular thing you're doing, that's not the, I'm like, stop it, man. <laughs> but anyway, we have a big show. You are funny. Not like, like, you know, like as Joe Pesci, am I funny? Like, do I amuse you? Do I amuse you? Do I, do I amuse you? <laughs> no, no. But nah, man. So welcome back, bro. It's been, uh, you know, every week <clears throat> between the time that we're doing the show until the next time we're doing the show, there's so much activity. Um, I called up my, my colleague last night because I was happy that um, uh, potentially had secured him a slot in an upcoming film festival to be a juror. Uh, look, Charles, may still happen. I don't know. <laughs> so we're checking, but um, yeah, I just came back from a film festival a couple of weeks ago. Um, I'm gonna be doing another film festival later this month. Charles is probably gonna be a part of that one as well. So our work is busy. Uh, you know, we are now, Charles, about four and a half months away from uh, not just the, the Lakefront Film Festival that we have a huge part in in planning, but also four and a half months away from uh, the, the sixth annual Bolts TV, AKA Black Reel Awards for Television. So we're very excited about that. Uh, my good friend, Charles Kirkland will have a huge and increased role in that, that we've discussed. So I am very excited for him. I am very excited for the production and if all that stuff wasn't enough before we start the show, today is opening day on baseball, for baseball. Only problem is, is I'm looking out the studio window right now, Charles. It's gray outside. I don't know if there's going to be a game tonight. Um, my beloved New York Mets, which I didn't put on the jersey or bring the hat over. Actually, smart, on. smart. Oh, Lord. Here we go. It's opening well, day. Uh the Mets are playing the Nats tonight. You don't have a Nat hat in the house, Charles? I do. Yeah, okay. Well, cool. So the Mets and Nats, <laughs> Nats kick off tonight. And um, so Tyler McGill's on the hill against uh, Patrick Corbin for the Nats. For anybody that's out there as a baseball fan, very excited. I am. So it's going to be a long season. I'll be rubbing Charles's nose in it. Uh, hopefully all season long between his Nats and O's, his Baltimore Orioles and his Washington Nationals. So we will have a lot to talk about. So so, so before you go any further to do my top or shut impression, the, the we're having rain throughout the day. It's expected to clear up around 4.30, 5 o'clock this evening so that they, the, the Nationals have moved their opening time from 4.30 to 
uh, 7.30, and we're expected to have a game tonight at 7.30. Now, for people who are watching us that don't live in the Washington metropolitan area, Topper Shutt is a noted meteorologist who uh, is probably a guy. I've been watching Topper Shutt now with 25 years. So, yeah, probably. It's so funny because I've seen Topper Shutt out in the streets, right? And, you know, he's real genteel. <laughs> he's doing the weather on television. Topper got an edge. Topper <laughs> being one of these in the street. But uh, oh, just show the edge. Uh, I'm just saying, Topper, Topper comes across really, really calm when he's like, like what you just did. But then you see Topper and say, hey, Topper. <laughs> <laughs> Topper is like, as Wu-Tang Clan once said, Topper shut ain't nothing to F with. <laughs> so just, hey man i'm just keeping it real in case you ever see topper remember my instructions do not just be running up on topper so but anyway <laughs> man, uh, we just keep it light here man have fun so uh big show today uh generally as a rule the last uh several weeks now we've been doing movie reviews in the bonus content of the show this gives us time to really air out and talk about subjects and we start off the day, Charles, you know, it's been two weeks, man, since the Oscars. And um, I hate to say it, man, the fallout continues, man. Um, here we are. Uh, there's a huge article in Variety this week. Uh, Will Smith, uh, what, what, what it takes to break Will Smith out of movie jail. And the funny part is they have a picture of Will Smith and then they're like four film reels which simulate bars. Uh, so it, it started off like, you know, oh man, it's Will Smith, man. This is a little small mat. It'll blow over. Not so fast. Uh, Will, so the question in the article was how Smith's predicament stacks up against the scandals of other A-list actors like Tom Cruise and Army Hammer. Army, Army Hammer. Now, Charles, well, we'll, we'll stick a pin in there because we'll come back to the Army Hammer part because that's a good one because Army Hammer, I was getting some cereal yesterday, and Army Hammer's picture was on the milk carton. I haven't seen <laughs> Army Hammer. That dude, like, he is in, like, some land. Him and Matt Lauer are hanging out. I don't know where Army Hammer is right now. Wow. Um, also in the article, Charles, the shaky status of upcoming Smith projects, including the Apple TV Plus slave drama Emancipation with Antoine Fuqua, which is really interesting because he literally finished filming that literally like maybe a couple of months ago, right? Um, and then what consumer sentiment surveys regarding Smith's Oscar slap say about the impact of his career? Charles, <clears throat> this is interesting because you and I have talked privately. We talked on the show that, um, you know, Chris Rock once had a joke where he said, you know, I have celebrity but only from a certain amount of, of, of space, right? You know, like from far away, you know, I'm inward, 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 inward. And then as people get closer, oh, that's Chris Rock. <clears throat> Will Smith's celebrity, and I, I may have talked about this last week, but I'm gonna start with this, is his celebrity stretches much further than just like a couple of feet. Will Smith, since, I mean, Fresh Prince, uh, Fresh Prince and DJ Jazzy Jeff, which is his start before him even doing the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. He won the first Grammy ever given out to a rap, for a rap single when Parents Don't Understand, which I think was 87 or 88, if I'm correct, somewhere in that vicinity. Somewhere so, around there. Yeah, so Maybe him and Jazzy Jeff have been a group since 1985, 85, 86, right? He gets the lead after, uh, you know, going through some financial difficulties and having to file for bankruptcy after uh, the whole situation with this record. And, you know, he was $3 million in debt. And then he gets thrown a lifeline when Quincy Jones and Benny Medina cast him as the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, right? Right. In the middle of doing the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, so this is 1990 when that show launched. And then by the time he's doing stuff like Six Degrees of Separation, Independence Day, you know, and on and on <clears throat> to becoming the Will Smith that we know now. 
it's been a good 30, 35 plus years of him being a solid citizen, a A-list super megastar, not superstar, a megastar. Him and Cruz are like way up here and everybody else is kind of down here when it comes to stardom in the game, right? Name recognition, recording music, you know, all in the news, him and his wife, Jada Pinkett Smith, the, the raising of their kids, all of the scandals and stuff that he's had to endure. And all of that was cool up until the night he laid hands on Brother Rock at the Oscars. And that has changed the trajectory for Will Smith because what that also introduced was a national conversation, literally that went on for about a week that everybody that did what we did were getting besieged with calls like, hey, Charles, what you, what you think about that Will Smith thing? <laughs> <laughs> so having said all of that, suddenly now there is impact because I was reading another article this morning that there was a, a Overbrook, which is Will Smith's production company, uh, was developing some sort of a, you know, YA or young adult kind of a film and the actress in that film pulled out. So the end result, Charles, is that a lot of the things that Will had uh, that his production company, which, by the way, several months ago, just got an infusion of about $600 million in cash. Suddenly, all these projects are coming to an er. We talked about Bad Boys 4. We talked about Emancipation. We talked about some other projects that Overbrook has. Um, this thing is you're talking about you're talking about Hancock too. You're talking about the Karate Kid too. You're talking about Uptown Saturday Night. All these things that he was supposed to be producing, all of a sudden. <laughs> <laughs> so Charles, talk about what you're seeing and what you feel because, you know, I don't. I mean, what, is this a situation, man? Because I know stuff is slowing down. Everything is perception in this business, right? And it's, it's about, you know, it's, uh, it's about, you have to, you have to, it's contrition, right? At some point, if he comes out and does something, which I'm really surprised that it's taken this long, right? I, I told you last week on the show, it would have been nothing to make a phone call to Oprah Winfrey. And suddenly there's a special on where Oprah is sitting down with Will in some garden, someplace with Jada. And the two of them are having a conversation or she may bring Chris Rocket. I'm surprised none of that stuff has happened yet for Will Smith because there are too many people who are in that circle who are invested in the Will Smith business. Will Smith works with a lot of people. You know, for an example, uh, James Lasseter, who is Will Smith's producing partner, produced uh, The Heart of the Fall. So you yeah. had Jay-Z working with Will Smith. Jay-Z and Will Smith are, 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 have worked together because back in the day when Willow was whipping her hair, Rock Nation, Jay-Z and Beyonce signed this dude. So it's like, my point is that there are a lot of people who have influence, especially in our culture, that are, that are in the orbit of Will Smith. And that I'm surprised to this point that there hasn't been I don't know, for lack of a better term, some sort of a, you know, billionaire summit. Like, hey, man, <laughs> this is what you need to do. We need to get you out of this predicament. Charles, what do you think about it? all of the stuff that I'm introducing right now? And, and why haven't we seen to this moment some level of Will either trying to put out a statement, trying to do something? Because all your projects are starting to go, er, you got to do something, man. Well, on the, on one hand, Will has been has put out a statement, a couple statements since since this uh, thing has happened. Um, however, I think the reason why we haven't seen the summit that you're talking about is Chris Rock is on the road; he's out there doing his thing, and and so to to pull him out, off the road. Matter of fact, he's got some concerts coming up in in D.C. at the end of this month. So uh, and and sold out concerts and, you know, you're not going to get the man to step away from sold out concerts. We, well, we just had the guy uh, cancel a concert to go to the North Carolina basketball game and, ha and had a whole bunch of people upset with him. So it's going to take a minute because Chris has got to finish his tour. And then I think at that point there may be a summit that uh, that occurs. The other problem is... Oh, well, wait a minute, Charles. I think you misunderstood me. I'm not saying a summit between Will and Chris Rock. I'm talking about a summit with people who care about Will 
who want to sit down with Will to try to figure out what he needs to do to try to, for lack of a better term, extricate himself from this matter and try to try to get people to put it behind them so that he can get back to being Will Smith. I, I, think, I, think, what is, I think what has happened is I think he's gotten counseling from some people and that's where these uh, contrition-like uh, explanations or uh, apologies have come out from him. I think the real problem is we have not heard anything from the Academy. They, they still have not made uh, any decision on what they're going to do yet. And uh, as I mentioned before, the apology that he issued may have been a, a, a preemptive strike of with him uh, resigning from the academy. That might have been a preemptive strike on what they were going to do. And so the academy has, is going to take some more time to figure out how they're going to handle it. And then at, at that point, then we can start maybe figuring out how we're going to repair well, but right now it's right. Everything seems to be in the hands of the Academy. So I, just like last week, we may be sitting out on the air doing this show and all of a sudden we, uh Oh, here comes a bulletin. Uh, this, this is, this is what the Academy says. We've been waiting for it. And I thought we were going to have it at the beginning of this week, but we, we still got to figure out what they're going to do. And then from that point, we can start working on, Hey, let's go sit down with Oprah because we don't even know how bad it's going to be. The, the Academy may come out and say, well, OK, you resign. We're just going to let that sit for a while and that'll be all that's going to happen. Um, what's the status of the Oscar? Is he going to is it going to be suspended? Is it going to be taken away? Or I don't think it's going to be done any of that stuff. But until all that is officially addressed. We're in this little nebulous area where people can just uh, make suppositions and uh, and claims about what should be done. So it's hard to it's hard to ask for ask for forgiveness and repent when you don't know what you're repenting from. Well, a couple of things, man, because you know I keep hearing people say this. Let's let's start and end right here. They're not taking any Oscar away because the nah, Oscar that's, that's was not giving to happen. him for the performance at King Richard. So that has nothing to do with his conduct on stage that night. So that's number one. Number two, part of, part of what I'm struggling with is that if he resigned from the Academy, the Academy can take action, but what action are they gonna take? Because a part of not being a part of the, a, a part of the, not consequence, but a part of the fallout of him not being in the Oscar or in the, in the voting Academy or in the Academy as a as an actor or producer or whatever uh, qualification or classification he would have used, if he's no longer in the academy, it doesn't stop the academy from nominating films that he's in. It's just he doesn't get a chance to participate in the project as a voter or or or, or be invited to industry events as an Oscar member. So. To me, the Oscar thing is kind of secondary because at this stage, I resigned from the Academy. I'm no longer a part of it, but I still got to work in Hollywood. And the, the fact, you know, I remember saying this to you, maybe it was private and not on this show, but the fact that you got money today doesn't mean you're going to have money tomorrow. And the fact that you had projects today, as we're now seeing doesn't mean that the, 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 the folks are going to always bankroll you because if you become somebody that people don't want to work with, getting back to the Army Hammer situation, Army Hammer was hot. Army Hammer was doing a lot of stuff, man. I mean, am I wrong? No, Army not Hammer, at all. Army Hammer, before I read his name in the article, what is the last time you even thought about Army Hammer? <laughs> it's... It, you know, exile in Hollywood is a real thing, right? I don't care. I don't care if you Eddie Murphy, you Will Smith, you can be Tom Cruise. You can be exiled in this business, man. It's very simple. People stop taking your call. People stop financing your projects. Suddenly you're on the outside looking in, trying to come back. And this is, this is a very real thing, man. So for me, I mean, look at look at Kevin Spacey. When Kevin Spacey got got slammed, not only did they did they cancel him, they withdrew him out of movies that he was already in. They they edited him out and put in another actor. So when you get blackballed in Hollywood, it means something. 
And, Man, it, let me tell and, you it, and it's a so, long process. Chris Noth, who I think I'm pronouncing his name correctly, who was yeah. Mr. Big and Sex in the City, and then he came back and he was doing the equalizer with Queen Latifah. And I remember all that stuff went down. They killed him off <laughs> on the equalizer. So he dead <laughs> on that show. And then he was in Sex in the City and he had a heart attack and he died in that show, which was good. Not good, but good because had he stayed on the show, they had to figure out a way to kill him off because, you know, bro, I'm telling you. So so I'm saying all that to say that for people who say, oh, you know, Will Smith's too big to cancel. I don't know. This is going to be a very interesting case. And, and to me, Charles, this is one of those situations that we're now almost two weeks away from it, right? And I'm thinking that if you want to do something, you got to you got to do something earlier, because the longer this goes on and we keep hearing news of your projects being stalled or people not wanting to work with you and pulling out or we haven't heard this yet. Well, actually, we have heard it in a way, because when people use the phrase that the project is stalled, that means that people who are bankrolling are going, hey, hey, let me put my money back in my wallet. Not so fast. So. This is a pretty significant action. And, you know, we talked about a bunch of names we've thrown around, right? So Army Hammer was, was, a, was a nice mid-side, a mid-star. He wasn't like a superstar. Kevin Spacey was a fine actor who was a wonderful actor, but he wasn't on the, on the Will Smith level. It bears watching because, unless I'm wrong, has there been somebody else recently, other than maybe, uh, dare I say, somebody like a Bill Cosby? Like I'm talking about somebody on a Uber star level who uh, n- no, there's there's not there's not many people on that Uber star level. I think the only person that have, have been close would maybe have been Kevin Hart or Dave Chappelle. And you know, their their scandals came and went, but uh they're still not the bankable star that Will Smith is. So I mean, may, maybe Kevin Hart, but you know, they, well, let me, it, well, let me tell tough. you, but, 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 that's a, but that's a good point, Charles. Let's talk about that for a second. So Kevin Hart had this the, the scandal where, of course, he had an extramarital affair, which nobody really in Hollywood cares about that because that happens all the time, right? So that, that one was like, eh. But the other one, which was huge, was that Kevin Hart always wanted to be a host of the Oscars, right? And I think to this day, Charles, looking at the Academy Award, The fact that they didn't let Kevin Hart host that show, who I think would have been perfect to host the Oscars and would have brought an audience to the Oscars that the Oscars sorely needed, right? As somebody explained to me, he not only had the ability to get people that were his age range, but he he could appeal down, which meant that the 18 to 49ers who knew who Kevin Hart was from all of his work, he would have been great bringing an audience to the Oscars, probably could have done some skits and done some stuff. He was a not having him host that show or even Eddie Murphy, because I remember Eddie Murphy at one point was going to host the show, not having cultural folks host this show, I think is a major mistake because it opens up a brand new audience that the Oscar, Oscars desperately needs. And we talked about the fact that you know, this year it went up 54% to like 16 million people after last year only having 10, which were the two lowest rated shows in the history of the Academy in year 93, year 94, right? So I say all that with Kevin Hart, that Kevin Hart scandal was just about the Oscars. You know, it wasn't, it didn't affect his, his ability to create movies. He has his own production company. Kevin Hart's got his hands on a lot of stuff, you know, whether it's Sirius XM, his, his, his constant touring to sold out arenas around the world. So Kevin Hart's situation is a little different. Dave Chappelle is even more, more, more different because Dave Chappelle is not about being a, a movie star. Dave Chappelle's lifeblood is him touring and doing the things that he does. And Chappelle, I mean, whenever you, whenever you have a deal with somebody like Netflix, and every time you create a show, a one hour show, like he'll tour and do all of the stuff to prepare a show. And then you drop an hour, hour and 20 minutes, hour and a half show. And Netflix strokes the check for $20 million. 
you pretty much are going to be good. <laughs> you, I mean, Chappelle did what about six specials on Netflix over the yeah, about yeah. five years? Yeah, and sold out shows between. Yeah, Chappelle's. I'm not going to say anybody's hard to cancel. <laughs> Chappelle is hard because there's a hardcore audience that are going to support Dave Chappelle. And again, I'm not saying that that's right. I'm just telling you that Chappelle is not reliant on Hollywood in a way that Will Smith is. Will Smith is an actor and a rapper, and he's less a rapper these days. Rapping is kind of what I do for fun. It was what I used to do. I still show you from time to time I could pull out a mic and I could hear the song and I could do me. But Will Smith ain't trying to go back and, and start making music new. Or, I mean, maybe he is, but I'm saying, you're not going, oh, man, that new Will Smith, Fred, that Jazzy Jeff from the Fresh Prince album is about to drop. We got to get to the store to get that. They streaming that. that that's not how Will Smith is going to eat. That's a part of, of what Will Smith is and was. You know, he out here writing books. You know, Will Smith's career is in being an action star. I mean, like being an actor. And that I think is the big difference between when you talk about a Hart or Chappelle or some of these other people who uh, have been embroiled in some of these scandals. But, you know, it, it bears watching, Charles. That's all I'm saying, man. It bears watching. And, and like you said, this is going to be, we're going to be watching this for some time now. It, it's not even close to, to its end yet. So we'll, we'll see. No, no, no. All right, man. So we've spent the first almost half an hour in our show doing this one, man. But this story jumped out to me um, a couple of years ago. I would say several years ago, there was a show that was on called American Gods. Did you ever watch that? Yeah. Yeah. OK. One of the things that I thought was fascinating about American Gods, which with these modern day, I, I guess, was, was it based on a graphic novel or a comic book of some kind? It was. It was. Okay. Neil yeah, you don't just have to ask because, you know, I don't know, man. You know, y'all be, y'all, y'all comic geeks, man. Y'all know all this stuff, man. But two of the guys that I loved about, two of the things that I loved about this show were two of the gods. One was an African god, and I can't even remember what her name was, but this was the one that they shocked you in the opening episode where she would go to the, go out to places, pick men up, bring them back and sleep with them. And in this one particular case, because I actually met this, the, the woman, I think her name was Yatundi, Y-E-T, I can't pronounce her name, but uh, African actress who in the middle of this scene, Charles, and you know what I'm talking about, she's sleeping with this guy. And let's just say to be really PG and nice on our show that... Uh, her and the guy became one in a, in a way that I, that made me uncomfortable watching it. I was like, whoa. <laughs> so I remember when I met her, I was like, oh, that's what we're doing. And she started laughing and she was like, yeah, I get that a lot. I'm like, I bet you do. <laughs> so the other guy, it brought, on there, it brought the term like, uniting in flesh to a whole nother level. I'm sorry. I had to go there. Look, you saw my face. Um, but the other god on there, which was nice, was uh, a spider god named Anasi. Anasi. That was played by um, my good friend. Uh, god, what is his name, man? It's so funny. I would say my good friend. They say, what is his name? Um, Orlando Jones. Orlando Jones has done this show several times. And, you know, I usually I used to run into Orlando Jones every year and we would just laugh and, and hang out at the Critics' Choice Awards or, or we were doing junkets and things of that nature. Orlando Jones, good dude, right? But he played this guy and then in probably one of the scenes, because I remember the year he got nominated for a Black Real Award for this, that, that opening scene, the first time these Africans are enslaved on a ship below the hull and he comes down and he talks to them. And you remember this, right? He's like, you know, uh, <laughs> you guys yeah. are going to be in captivity for, for three centuries. He said, but there's some good news. You know, when they get you to America, you're going you gonna to farm this cotton. And this cotton is going to give them and their family cancer. <laughs> I was like, wow. <laughs> so, and on and on, if you, if you don't know what I'm talking about, just Google a Nazi American Gods, fantastic scene. I should play on our show, but I'm not going to do that. But pretty much, so 
Anasi was a character that was really, really popular. And then I think within the second season, Freeman came, there was some disagreements and his character was written out of the show. And the reason why that was important, because for me, it was a time I stopped watching American Guys, because after they took out that character, I was like, yeah, I'm good. You can have the rest of it. American Guys, I think, got canceled shortly thereafter. Maybe it went on another season and limped out. But now Amazon is bringing back uh, a new series called Anasi's Boys, based on the character from American Gods. And Whoopi Goldberg, they just signed her up to be Bird Woman in Anasi's Boys. Now, I don't know if you ever read the comic book, but this is going to be a new Amazon adaptation of the same guy's original story, American Gods, but really focusing on this one character. And from what I'm reading, Charles, he said the character follows Charlie Nance, uh, Malachi Kirby, who played Kunta Kinte in Roots, the new Roots. Right? The new Roots, yeah. Right, sometimes known as Fat Charlie, which is really interesting because the dude is really slim. Uh, it was his father's nickname for him. He's not fat. Thank you. A young man who is used to be embarrassed by his strange, uh, used to being embarrassed by his estranged father, played by Delroy Lindo. But when his father dies, Charlie discovers that he was a Nazi, trickster god of stories. And after he learns that he has a brother, and he and that brother, Spider, also played by Kirby, is entering Charlie's life, determined to make it more interesting but making it a lot more dangerous instead. I'm watching that one, Charles. I'm watching that one. So uh, Whoopi Goldberg's character, Bird Woman, is the god of birds and a key antagonist in the series. She's the embodiment of birds, not just the beautiful stately birds in flight. Anyone who's had a close encounter with a seagull knows that some birds are more dangerous than others, and Bird Woman is the most dangerous of them all. Long ago, a Nazi did her wrong, now may be her chance to turn the tables. Birds and spiders, you know, yeah, they, they don't work together very good. Birds and spiders, I, I, man. When I heard about this, I was disappointed that Orlando wasn't involved in it. I because I, I really liked the way what he brought to the character. Um, and like you said, Orlando's a big friend friend of ours on the show. We met we had one episode where Orlando came on and spoke. And uh, it was wonder. It was a great episode. He went on for maybe thirty minutes about his life and things that were going on, and I believe something happened with the recording that that happened, and we never got to actually publish the episode that he did. But I mean, he <laughs> gave us right. some great insights. No, that was a, that was an interview we did with him. Orlando has done this show. It's funny because. You know, as an aside, stick a pin in, in the Orlando part. Charles and I had a long conversation yesterday that uh, we're about two weeks away from the 500th episode of this show. We've been doing it since 2009. And um, I was reading, Charles, some of the names of people who have appeared on this show uh, in the first 13, yeah, 13 years. Pretty impressive. So a lot of them literally that I forgot. I'm like, oh, yeah, we did have such and such on the show. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Who knew? <laughs> Who knew on that cold uh, winter night in November 19th, 2009, that here we would still be doing Keeping It Real with Film Gordon in 2022? So, yeah, but I say all that to say that Orlando Jones has been on this show several times. But to Charles's point, you're absolutely right. Uh, whatever happened, something happened where there was some sort of technical difficulty and we never aired it, but you're right. He, we asked uh, Orlando a question. He just kept going. I was sitting there like, <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, but yeah, man, um, you're, but I, but it sounds like Charles getting back to a Nazi's boys that, um, they're going younger, which is probably why you wouldn't have Orlando Jones be a part of this one, because from reading the description, this is him. Come on, come on now. 20. Come on. They're getting, Del, Del, they're getting Delroy Lindo to play a Nazi. Orlando no, they're getting Jones, Delroy Lindo to play his father. So who was an, is a Nazi. So pretty much you're saying that Orlando Jones, Orlando Jones couldn't be Delroy Lindo's son. He could have been Malachi Delroy. Kirby. It works. He could much have been better. Delroy Lindo's character. He could have been Delroy Lindo. 
Yeah, but then he would have only been on there and as a token because what it sounds like is that the dad is not going to make it past the first episode. So why would you hire Orlando Jones and have him play a single episode of a character that people love watching him play? He's going. He's going. Well, I have a feeling he's going to be in more than just one episode, and even so, it would have been a nice con- connective tissue to the to the original series. Yeah, That's I mean. All. I mean that's a thought, but again, when you think about Del, and you're actually right about Delroy Lindo, because if you're gonna do Delroy Lindo, you gotta have Delroy Lindo longer than one episode, I would think. It's Delroy Lindo. You don't, you know, as Delroy Lindo, you don't even read the script. If you only gonna have me in an episode, I mean, but this, good point. Good point, Charles. Okay. Thank that's you. all you had on that one. Okay, I was waiting for you to, to, to put some other stuff in. All right, that's all you got. All right. So let's move on to the next piece of casting news. And this one is interesting because it's a guy who, uh, when I was younger, read a lot of the Black Panther Party. And I'm sitting here looking at my library right now to find out how many books that I have uh, from party members. I know there's Elaine Brown. There's um, Mr. Hillman, Earl Hillman. There's a bunch of books that I have here about the Black Panther Party. And this latest story that Apple, again, very active, uh, has ordered a Huey P. Newton limited series with Andre Holland and talks to star as Huey Newton, Huey P. Newton, and Don Cheadle to direct this story of uh, one half of the two guys that created one of the most interesting community movements in Black culture in the, in the mid-1960s, the Black Panther Party, created in 1966 in Oakland, Huey P. Newton, Bobby Seal. That's all you need to say, man. If you don't know, as as Pusha T said, if you know, you know. If you don't know, you need to Google, study, and find out about the Black Panther Party, which had such an amazing impact. Uh, Also with, you know, uh, the US organization, Ron Karenga, who later went on to create Kwanzaa. It's a lot of Black history out there, man, but I'm very interested in the telling of uh, this story. Now, from what I'm reading, Charles, it says it's going to be a six-episode series from Warner Brothers Television with Holland and talks to stars Newton. Uh, Let's see. The showrunner is Janine Sherman Barrios, who has been a showrunner for shows like Claws, and she also was a part of the self-made Madam C.J. Walker series from a couple of years ago. Um, And also The Kings of Napa, which is on now. So they've hired Don Cheadle to direct and executive produce the first ep- first two of the six episodes that are on. And the series, Charles, is going to be based on a Playboy article of the same name, uh, The Big Cigar, which tells the true story of how Huey P. Newton relied on his best friend, Burt Snyder, the Hollywood producer behind Easy Rider, to elude a nationwide manhunt and escape to Cuba while being pursued into exile by the FBI. Okay. That's a story I wasn't familiar with. Okay. <laughs> uh, let me see. Yeah. Um, the Big Cigar marks Cheeto's latest outing as a director as he expands his presence behind the camera in addition to his numerous acting roles. Uh, of course, Cheeto has previously directed multiple episodes of the popular Showtime series House of Lies, as well as the Miles Davis biopic Miles Ahead. Huh. Interesting. So there you go, man. So, I, so I, it's actually I, so the series is actually going to be called The Big Cigar. Okay. Okay. I, I just saw Miles Ahead again the other day, and um, I, I, I think that my, that was pr- some pretty good work. I, I like what everything that he's done, and now that he's his uh, back isn't broken in the Marvel universe, I mean he can <laughs> he can do some more things. So. You know, uh, Don Cheadle, he's got lots of cred, man. He's He's been building up his uh, his repertoire, and uh, this directing thing seems to be coming pretty easy for him. So I'd like to see what he's going to do. I mean, he does a good job, so. Yeah, man. It's, it's going to be interesting, man. I'm just, I'm and, just... and, 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 you know, we talked about uh, Huey P. Newton, um, Huey Newton and uh, the Black Panther Party. We, we, we just saw some of that in Judas and the Black Messiah, that whole story that you're talking about. That, uh, that I mean, they were very innovative. 
very uh, uh, influential in the in the black community back in the sixties. Ten point, ten point uh, program. Um, you know, I have a lot to say about the Black Panther Party. That that's a show all to himself. It's to to itself, but um, you know, this was this was a part that I think what would be a good movie idea for me would be developing a story of, I don't want to say a Forrest Gump sort of an individual, but maybe that is it. Somebody who's probably an individual who lives during what I think is the most tumultuous decade of the 20th century was the 1960s, man. You had, you know, it's already been noted that people like Mega Evers, Dr. King, Malcolm X, uh, John F. Kennedy, Robert F. Kennedy, uh, and so many others that were just literally assassinated during this period, right? You also had the upheaval and the, the first Rome, you know, the youngest president we had ever had with John F. Kennedy and that whole situation in the early 1960s. You got scandal in the White House that we find out about all this stuff after the fact. Uh, there is the signing of the Civil Rights Act. There's the March on Washington with Dr. King. There's, there's the, the creation of the Black Panther Party. There's 1968, or one of the most incendiary years in, in, of all time in modern era. There was just a lot of stuff that happened in the 1960s. You put a man on the moon. We did a lot of stuff that was amazing. And then that's not even talking about all the art of the 1960s, whether it was Motown, the Beatles, uh, the Beach Boys, the Doors, Jimi Hendrix, Woodstock. Um, uh, what a summer of soul. I mean, there is so much just, just, just like capital that happened in that period. It's just ridiculous to me. And I was born in that decade. And so I was too young to really understand. And then also that's not taking into account that there was the watch riots and the riots in Newark and riots in Detroit and Baltimore and all these other things that happened. A lot of stuff in the 1960s. And I still say it's still the most, I use the word tumultuous. It's the, it's the decade that literally changed everything because going into the 1960s, remember, Charles, and this is just a small history lesson and I'm gonna stop it. But going into the 1960s, you know, you had the Eisenhower years where there was like white picket fence, you know, the, America's <laughs> racism was there. But, you know, it was kind of all painted and nice. It was the early days of television. <clears throat> so movies were still kind of movies, the golden era. 1960s comes along, man, the, the, the fall of the studio system. These renegade filmmakers in the late 60s, man, you've got Sidney Poitier has been introduced and we're trying to do stuff around race. So, of course, there are movies like uh, uh, Raisin in the Sun in 61, Paris Blues, Sidney Poitier would win an Oscar in 63. He's the number one box office star in 1967 with three movies, In the Heat of the Night to Serve with Love. And guess who's coming to dinner? There's also the pushback because the Black Panthers and the Us organization and SNCC and SLC, S SCLC and other uh, organizations, everybody is trying to figure out the Nation of Islam with Malcolm X and all that stuff that's going on. The 60s is just buck wild. Like the more I talk about it, Maya Angelou over in Africa, uh, it's, like, it's just off the hook how the 60s- We were uh, everything. not just a company. It's a movement. What's wrong? Are... Whatever it is, turn it off because it'll copyright us. <laughs> so, so needless to say, man, out of the 60s comes a whole lot of change and movement. The 1970s, the, the era sorts of changes. We've got, you know, also, uh, you know, women's rights takes up. There, there are a lot of things that happened in the 70s that were a direct result of what we call the big chill era, the 1960s. Uh, that there's a lot of stuff. So to me, when we talk about, you know, this series with uh, the big cigar, it, you know, there's always going to be nice stories about the 1960s or different stories or variations of tales that are told during that decade. And you look around the last couple of years, the MLK docs, uh, you know, stories about this athlete, stories about this person, this political person. That's the, that's the era. If you go back and look at our history, 
There's the time before 19, but when you get to 1959, when you get to 1970, the Vietnam War, everything that happened, it was so, it was almost like packing five decades worth of stuff into 10 years in the 1960s. Well, you know, it all started in 55 with uh, Emmett Till, I think. And that, because Emmett Till, the, the, the lynching of Emmett Till was really what put people like Martin Luther King on the forefront about we have to stand up for these these civil rights, and so uh, as as sixties as the sixties turn five years later, King has been making his speeches, and I mean things start really like you said it was just the explosion of the push and the the conv the convincing of the world about civil rights in in this nation, and and yeah, it's that the sixties, man, if you if you could have a <laughs> And you and you said a Forrest Gump type character to go through and 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 be a witness to all these things that have happened that that have occurred. Um, it it would be a powerful movie, but the, I think the thing is, you're still going to have to connect it to how how things. I mean, things have changed today, but are are they really different? So we really have to look at that as well because uh, we've come a long way. But we still haven't gotten there yet. So, I mean, you talk about Whoopi Goldberg. She's got a Nazi's voice, but she's also got the Till, which is coming out later on this year, which is a story of, of Emmett Till. We've seen it on Women Who Define the Movement that ABC did a while ago, but uh, Whoopi's got a movie coming out this fall uh, also on that st story of uh, Emmett Lewis Till. And how his lynching affected the 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 uh, whole tenor of civil rights in 1955 and on from there. So I mean, it's we we look back we look back, but it brings us still to the point where we got to look forward because we haven't gotten there yet. Well, you know, it's interesting to me, man, because I tell the story a lot that subconsciously there were there were always three people that two people in particular and the specter of one person that kind of hung over my upbringing, right? I grew up uh, born in the mid sixties, eight years after the death of Emmett Till, right? Uh, in Newark, New Jersey, right? And I grew up in a section that they had literally just built all these projects, right? You know, like every street, I think I grew up on Howard Street, right? And Howard Street had 188, 182. And then, of course, there was another section of Howard Street that extended down. I think that was 176 and 180. I don't remember the numbers because all that stuff is gone now. But to my right, when I would come out of the projects, was Lincoln Street. <laughs> Behind me might have been, uh, I forget the name of the street, but, there were, but it was like a series of projects that were all brick. Hence the nickname of my hometown, the Brick City, right? Newark, New Jersey, right? And I remember you heard me talking earlier about, you know, the Black Panthers and one of the Black Panthers innovations was their free breakfast program that made sure that they fed kids a, a breakfast because they thought it was really important that for a child to start his day off, that a, a nice, healthy, nutritious breakfast was the way. So where I grew up, we had the free breakfast programs. We had the free lunch programs. And so a lot of that stuff touched me, right? So that's the, the, the Till connection, right? Thinking about, you know, understanding of what we were watching during that era to understand that despite you being, you know, being young black boys, that if you were in the wrong environment, that you were not safe, right? So we knew that and understood that as, as a child, right? Or as young people. And then Martin Luther King, hmm. of course, and Malcolm X. So those two things, especially living where I lived, I didn't even understand until years later, the impact of not just Martin Luther King, but Malcolm X, because I lived in a city that, as we come to find out within the last year or two, that the the people responsible for the assassination of Malcolm X came from the mosque in Newark, New Jersey, right? So there was a, so I always wondered and never got an answer until I watched that special in 2019, 2020, 
mm. <laughs> about yeah. why in my town that Islam was so prevalent, right? Like there was so much Islam in Newark and I never understood why until I watched that special and went, oh, that's what happened. <laughs> so I remember, I remember as a kid, um, I would come up the hill, Charles. We had the Henry Aaron baseball field that they built brand new when I was like 10. And I remember you would come up the street or if you were lucky enough, like I remember we played a playoff game one time and a kid hit a home run to beat us. But literally right up the hill was the Amiri Baraka Center. So Amiri Baraka, <laughs> you know who he is. So I'm saying yeah. there, was a, there was an undercurrent I, dare I use the word of revolution? Like when I was a kid, like I didn't even understand why I was so hyped up and wired up and cared and, and, and inspired in several, in several ways until as an adult, as I said, I was almost, I'm like in my, in my fifth decade. And I was like, oh, that's why. That's <laughs> why my parents, that's why we were doing, oh, that's why all my cousins were, Oh, okay. So I say all that to say that Malcolm X is important, Emmett Till is important. <clears throat> and of course, Dr. King is very important because it was funny. I remember being in my house years ago and I looked around and Dr. King was everywhere, whether it was a portrait that I had bought uh, at a gallery of him on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial in 1958, five years before <laughs> the March on Washington. So a duplicate photo of him wearing his preacher's robe whether it was the Ebony magazines that had been collected that his picture was on. And I looked around one day and I was like, hey, do I have a Dr. King museum in my house? Perhaps I do, books of Dr. <laughs> King. So Dr. King, Malcolm X and Emmett Till are a huge part of the, the specter of Till and the teachings of Malcolm X, the teachings of Martin Luther King, these two kind of yin and yang men who by the time both of them got to the end of their lives, were much more, much more uh, united in vision than they were apart. So I say all that to say, I know we do an entertainment show, but yeah, we read a lot of books here and we study a lot of stuff. And, and it's important to understand that when we talk about themes like the 1960s, it's also important to understand and know that in all of our brains, Charles, I'm sure we have, we probably got like eight minutes, man. Give me a little bit about what, Growing up in Washington must have meant during that same time period because you're a little a little younger than I am. But okay, you yeah, I was born nineteen days nineteen nine nine nineteen days after the assassination of Martin Luther King. Nineteen days. Nineteen days. Okay. Um, the Washington D.C. where I was lived was still in the throes of riots. Where people were protesting the 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 uh, the treatment, uh, the the whole situation, and my father was unable to make it to my birth because he was not uh, there was curfew on the street and he couldn't get from house to the hospital in time enough for for my birth, yeah. and uh, I mean. The, the Martin Luther King had always been and forever will be, I suppose, uh, the icon in our family. We, we grew up Christian, uh, uh, Baptist believing, uh, and, and he was a leader for us. And so e even after his death, I, mean, I, I never knew him in life. I only knew him through his martyrdom. And he was a martyr for us. And he was, uh, I mean, he was a Baptist preacher, a, a Nobel Prize winner. I mean, he was the linchpin. We didn't, we, I mean, we knew, uh, my father made sure that I knew about Malcolm X and the Black Panther Party and all those other things. But Martin Luther King, he was the benchmark. And so for many years, you know, he had been held in high esteem. And so lately when these uh, stories come out, you know how a philanderer he may have been and all those things, those kind of, those things kind of hit hard. Like, man, you're talking about the guy. I, 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 I'm not saying he was an idol, but I mean, he was a legend to me. So, you know, uh, it, um, growing up again, like in that time, 
and in DC, Chocolate City, the heart of, uh, of I don't know, you, you whatever you want to call it, the, the renaissance of the uprisings and all the things that were happening. Mm-hmm. Uh, Black history was very important for us in, in this city. And they taught it in our schools to a level that I'm surprised at other school, school systems I find out growing up. They just didn't get as deep as they did in, in, in Washington, D.C. And so I'm, I'm eternally thankful. But it, it was only because, uh, I mean, all of it was centered around Martin Luther King for me. So uh, it's always, every time I see someone do, and we had, what was that, um, respect, when we had that actor portray Martin Luther King, I was like, Nah, that's not Martin Luther King. Nah, he's nowhere. I was a, I was appalled by by his portrayal. I'm like, no, no, no. Come on, you, you got to do better than that. So uh, you know, I, 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 it's just special to me. It'll always be special to me. I was gonna say, interestingly enough, uh, as we sit here this week uh, on Monday, April fourth, was the uh, I don't know, 1968 to now. So. 54 years 22. yeah so it was the anniversary of his assassination and uh, on that day there was a couple of songs that i played <clears throat> one is from you know charles and i laugh about you two made a song in 1984 called pride in the name of love you know in the name of love one more in the name of love so the song is written about dr king but that song could be about anybody who's been martyred or murdered. It could have been, you could have sang that for George Floyd. One more in the name of Trayvon Martin. One more in the name of love, man. Um, but I, I thought about that. I thought about Dr. King a lot on Monday. Listen to that song. And then I also listen to uh, the, the King, what is it, the King Freedom Chorus, you know, uh, which I normally play that on his birthday, you know, uh, sing, celebrate, sing, sing, celebrate for yeah. the King. So I love that song. I remember when that song dropped like 35 years ago. I was like, but but again, that's another story. That's another story. I'm sorry, because I was about to go on another tangent because we only got like a couple of minutes left. But Charles, I spent yesterday, which you would probably get a kick out of, listening or thinking about a time 35, 37 years ago when we were in the throes of, of humanitarian philanthropy, right? You know, you had Do They Know About Christmas, where England, you know, all of the greatest singers of England, you know, the Bonos and Stings and Boy George and all these guys got together and made a song to benefit hunger in Ethiopia, which inspired Lionel Richie and Michael Jackson to write We Are the World and then bring together all those folks. And then a year later, the Dr. King Ensemble with Whitney Houston and Run DMC and all these people get together which then leads into, um, what's his name? Uh, K, uh, Boogie Down Productions, uh, KRS-One. KRS, to yeah. bring all these guys together for self-destruction, which then led to we all in the same gang. So it was a time where people, which I wish we had that spirit today, that artists would unite in order to find a cause and create music around these causes. It was it was amazing rewatching. Oh, that, I forgot about that. that's what friends are for. Remember that? Uh, yeah. Dion yeah. Warwick, Sydney. I mean Sydney. Dion Warwick, Stevie Wonder, Elton John, and Gladys Knight get together to fast. So I spent probably about a half hour just going through in chronological order and studying all these humanitarian efforts in the impact of watching all these artists come together. So so watching, we are the world again. If you haven't seen that video in a minute, it gives you chills because some of those people aren't around anymore. And just to see, oh, snap. So you, oh, Steve Perry. Oh, Kenny Loggins. Oh, Diana. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so, yeah, man, that was a lot of fun, man. But as you can tell, I have way too much time, man. I, I'm just a nerd, man. I'm watching stuff. I'm always studying, always trying to, to understand and put, put times into a certain context, right? It's one thing to live in the moment, but we have to let the past inform us as we move forward into the future. And that's fortunately what we try to do in this show. And we run out of time. How about that, Charles? We filled another (laughs) hour of the big show. Stuff that was happening this weekend. Will Smith, you stay up, bruh. I don't know what that means, but just stay up. (laughs) 
<laughs> Stay up. Josh, yeah, okay. anything before we wrap it up? Uh, no, nothing that would keep us within the hour limit. I, I don't want to go <laughs> any further past, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to let it go. All right, man. Well, that, you know, as we tell you guys every week in closing, please see something good at the movies. We have a bonus episode of the big show coming up a little later on. Stay tuned for our reviews of films this week. Until next time, you guys enjoy, and we will see you on the other side. You guys take care. Take care, Charles. See you. All righty, man.